please take the time right now to silence your cell phones. It's a thrill to welcome Mark to the stage to kick off the Sapiens session. When Mark is not busy working on Sapiens, he is actually out line dancing. This project originated with Cuz PhD research on Sapiens, which he then turned into a large-scale industrial application. It is my pleasure to welcome Mark and Ka both to the stage. Hello. Hi, everyone. So I'm Mark Harmon. I'm the engineering manager of the Sapiens team in Facebook London. And I'm here with Kerr Mao. And we're going to spend the next 20 minutes telling you about the Sapiens technology. Uh, the Sapiens team is part of the developer and release engineering, excuse me, the developer and release efficiency team at Facebook, which sits within the developer infrastructure team. And our job in that team is to provide the tools and the technologies that help developers move faster in their development. And in particular, what we do in the Sapiens project is we try to create a, a framework for friction-free fault finding. By friction-free, what we mean is friction-free for the for the users who don't have to experience crashes and friction-free for the developers who don't have to design test cases. So this technology that we've built at Facebook um, is based on scientific research on search-based software engineering and also lots of open source software. So we in the project have benefited greatly from the developer community, the open source community and the scientific community. And we very much like to be able to contribute back to that community. And so we are planning to make the Sapiens technology publicly available at some future point. Right now, we're in the process of developing the technology. And so we would really love to hear from you if you've got suggestions for which of these features you hear about today that you like and which features you would like to see in a, a publicly available version of the technology. Also, perhaps if there are features we don't mention, please also tell us about those, and we can consider working these into the technology before we release it publicly. So the starting point for Sapiens is this, that we have a, a phone in our hand, and it crashes. This is a fact of life. It happens, uh, it happens to all, all developers, and so we test our apps. So can I ask you, put your hands up if you've ever done any testing at any time in your career. OK, yeah, most people, I think. Yeah, can you keep your hands up if that was the most exciting and rewarding thing you ever did <laughs> in your whole career? I can't see a single hand up. You know, if we think about testing, we probably imagine that it's, it's slow. It's, it's actually painful. It, it feels like drawing teeth sometimes. It, it's, it, it's, if, we, if we're honest, it's, it's actually quite a boring activity. And for all these reasons, it tends to become regarded implicitly as unimportant. That is until one day when suddenly the whole system fails and it becomes extremely urgent. In the industry as a whole, the problem of automating testing has largely been split into two parts. The automated part is with the machine, but the design of the test cases is with the engineer. What we're trying to do in Sapiens is essentially pull out the machine so that it will take over more of the problem space. There will still be a few test cases and test problems that will need the developer's domain expertise, but our hope is that we can use machines to automate most of the testing process. So we'll use machines to design and execute test cases. We use search-based software engineering, which is nothing more than the combination of search-based optimization on the one hand and software engineering problems on the other hand. And the particular technique we use in Sapiens was published in a scientific paper at the International Symposium on Software Testing and Analysis, which is ISTA to its friends. That was uh, in two years ago, in 2016. So if you want to read about the technical scientific details that underpin the technology, and also read about the scientific evaluation of it against state of the art and state of practice, then you can read this paper. I think you can find it simply by searching for Sapiens with a Z, and then ISTA, I-S-S-T-A. It's uh, available without paywall. And the starting point for our idea, the philosophy behind the whole approach, is that test cases live in an enormous search space, far too large to enumerate. The, the number of sequences of events for an Android phone is larger than the number of stars in the known universe. And so hoping to enumerate all of them is impossible. What we do, do instead is we try and sample intelligently. Other techniques which sample intelligently, on the one hand, would be a random fuzzer, which simply randomly generates test cases, or a human tester who carefully crafts special test cases. 
We try to impose sapiens in between these two extremes, getting some of the benefits of the intelligence of human design through computational search and some of the benefits of automation through random fuzzing, but without the purely random nature of the fuzzing process. So sapiens has these three ingredients or secret sauce. Well, they were secret sauce until a few minutes ago, but now we're going to tell you all about them. So the first of these is this idea of motive genes. So a motive gene is a collection of low-level events which together mean something more significant. They have a motive. So, for example, consider a, a, a login screen. If we just randomly fuzz that and just type random, we, we'll probably just end up hitting the submit button over again. We're very unlikely to realize that, first of all, we need to type in the username, like that. There it is. And the password. <gasps> my password. Oh, it's OK. That's not my real username. I'm safe. Thank goodness for that. OK, so what we do with Sapiens is we teach it about these motives. So it knows, first of all, it has to type a valid username, then it has to type a valid password, and only then can it press submit. So that's a motive gene, and that helps us to chunk the search space so it's not quite such a random search and not quite such a big problem. We use genetic algorithms. The idea here is that we take a sequence of test cases, and we have a fitness function that measures whether they're performing well. I'll tell you about the fitness functions in a minute. So there's a selection process that selects test cases. The ones that survive the selection process go on to be crossed over. So the idea here is to take a little bit of one test case, a little bit of another, put them together. The hope is that the, the resulting child will be better than the two parents. The crossed over test cases then get mutated. This brings a bit of new information into the search. And the whole process is iterative. So the idea is that over a sequence of generations, our test cases gradually improve through evolution. So what are the fitness functions that guide our search? Well, a natural thing to use when you're trying to find crashes in a software system would be to elevate the coverage of the system under test. So if we find a test case here and we can find another one that has higher coverage, then we'll favor those. So that's one dimension. But the trouble with that is if we only optimize for that, we'll end up with very, very long test sequences, and that's a real difficult debugging chore. So instead of that, we also have an other objective the sequence length, which we try to make as short as possible. So on one axis, we have the shortness of the test case, and on the other, we have the coverage. You might think, well, coverage is the good thing, and the length is the bad thing, so why not divide the benefit by the cost and get some sort of you know, benefit per unit cost, coverage over length? We could do that. We get a solution something like this, a sort of middling solution. But the thing is, the extreme points are still interesting. One of them gives us great coverage, but with a long sequence, and the other gives us not very good coverage, but at least with a very short sequence. And in fact, everything in between is also interesting. So instead of just dividing coverage by length, we make this so-called Pareto front of solutions, and our algorithm evolves the Pareto front, pushing it forwards in time to find good compromises between coverage and length. When the algorithm finally stabilizes, we then have found some crashes, we hope, because we're testers, so we like to find crashes. Unusual, I know, but it's a kind of evil world. So we find these crashes, we report them to developers, and the idea is that because we've also optimized all along for, for length, there, there's a, a good chance that they'll be easy to debug, or at least easier. So we deployed this at Facebook, and this means scaling up. So to scale up the technology, we have to deal with the problem that at Facebook, not unlike many other large tech companies, we have an awful large number of diffs being committed into the code repository. In fact, over 100,000 diffs per week. Fortunately, to balance against that uh, scalability challenge on the problem side, we can also scale on the solution side. So we can scale up the number of emulators we, we can use using the One World emulator um, interface at Facebook. The platform provides us with arbitrary numbers of emulators. So right now, we're using hundreds of emulators on each app and that can allow us to deal with hundreds of thousands of diffs. And overall, we're really pleased that we can achieve a fix rate of approximately 75% on all of those crashes we find. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Ker Mao, and he's going to tell you more about how we deployed Sapiens at Facebook. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mark. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ker Mao. I'm a software engineer on Sapiens. So next, I'll talk about more technical details about Sapiens. Um, Sapiens, the young project, Facebook, it started in last February and deployed last September. 
And so far, it helped engineers fix many app crashes before ship them to users. And now Sipping is part of Facebook continuous integration process, which helps engineers move faster. So as Mark mentioned, SIP itself is a friction-free fault-finding technique. But to work deploy SIPings here at Facebook is not a friction-free process. Actually, we encountered quite a few challenges. And here I'd like to share three of them and, and how SIPing tackled these challenges. The first, scale. So testing at a large scale, like at Facebook, is challenging. So customize SIPing's implementation to support the scale and to work with our existing infrastructure for continuous in integration. So here shows the overview of Sipping's um, core to design operator. And um, the Sipping's host is implemented in Python 3 with new features like async IO and typing. And evolution engine is the core component that performs the guided to design process. And Sipping's evaluates general test on many concurrent Android emulators um, as shown on the right. And on each of the emulator, there's a core component named Motive Core. It's responsible for test initialization and interpret Sipping test into low-level Android executable events. And Sipping's consume many concurrent emulators provided by the Facebook OneWord platform. So OneWord is a resource man management system used at Facebook for large-scale testing. It provides remote connections to um, testing devices and runtimes like browsers and emulators. So Sipping's consume many concurrent OneWord emulators for um, automated test design without any manual assistance. Here shows a brief demo showing that Sipping's automatically generate tasks for Facebook for Android app. Uh, you can see here each grade is Android emulator, and Sipping's automatically generate system level tasks to simulate user interaction with the app and check if any failure has been introduced. And note that Sipping's can lo automatically log in with test user account, and no real, real, real user data is accessed here. So our second challenge is about how to make Sipping's fit into our existing continuous integration process. So on a high level, Sipping continuously tests the automated builds of Facebook app. You might have heard the Facebook static analysis to infer. So our deploy mode is similar to infer, but instead of doing static analysis, we dynamically test the builds. So here shows some um, typical process. So suppose Android engineer submitted a change of the Facebook app. A diff needs to be submitted to Fabricator. It will be revealed there and then landed to master branch if it, it gets accepted. And then the change will be picked by automated builds. And Sipping automatically fetches those automated builds and generate tests to review if any crash has been introduced. And once a crash is, is detected, Sipping can also automatically um, localize which line in which diff introduced the crash and the file inline comment back to the developer via Fabricator. So Sipping is deployed in multiple modes in order to support um, testing artifacts generated at different stages of the software development lifecycle. For example, it can perform deep search for comprehensive testing on um, post land build for um, deep search. And it also can um, perform shallow search in order to read the signal quicker on smoke build. So we found that Sipping sometimes can read signal only minutes after developer submitted diff for review. Well, on the back end, Sipping's continuous run is enabled by a combination of workflows. And these workflows are built on top of Abilona Flow platform. So Abilona Flow is the backbone of Facebook artificial intelligence. It's used across company for machine learning experiments and other continuous jobs like Sipping's. Well, inside Sipping's evolution workflow, a pipeline of operators work together. For example, the build operator automatically fetch most recent smoke build or post land build and pass them to search operator, which designed the test. And then the set operator automatically localized the fault and charged it to a right owner. Our third challenge here is how to provide debugging support to our developers. So as you may be aware, the one controversial aspect about end-to-end -end system level testing is that it captures too much information. And sometimes it's very expensive for our developers to debug or review the issues. It's meaningless if Sapiens only reports lots of crashes, but we don't know who should fix them or they are too expensive to fix. So Sipping tries to provide as much debugging support as possible. Well, SEFT is short for Sipping's automated fault localization and triage. And here shows the process on how it helps engineers to re remove the crash from production. So suppose a crash is reviewed by Sipping's evolution workflow, the crash data will be passed to the SEFT operator. And the operator will first localize the first broken build and first good build for that crash. And all the diffs between these two um, builds are considered as suspicious diff. 
And then Sipping tries to rank these diffs by using some heuristics. For example, it will go through each crash stack of the stack trees and analyze if any recent diff changed that crash through line. And if multiple diffs change that line, we use some of your other heuristics to help rank the diffs. For example, we favor the upper stack and most recent commit to the broken build. And finally, CP accept will triage the crash to the most suspicious diffs owner and file inline comments via fabricator. So we observe that CPIN signal have a very high true positive rate. So usually developer will file a fix for CPIN rate signal in a timely manner. Well, in addition to CPIN's evolution workflow, we have a few other workflows that work together to provide debugging support. For example, the crash reproduction workflow periodically fetches CPIN's reported crash and validate it if they can be reproduced consistently. And CPIN's fix detect work workflow automatically collects a set of fix indicators and tries to classify if the crash has been fixed or not. If it, ha it has been fixed, the CPINs can close the relevant task. If it's not fixed, and especially if the crash hit users, CPINs can file tasks to alert relevant developers. Since CPIN deployment, we um, help an engineer fix many app crashes. And you might be curious about the, um, the top courses that um, crash Facebook app. So here shows distribution of the most uh, popular exceptions. As you can see here, the most uh, common ones are caused by non-potents, which may not be surprising. Actually, we found 70% um, of the crash types that the Crash Facebook app have overlap with those reviewed on top 1,000 popular Android apps, as shown um, based on previous research work. So in addition, we CPNs have a few other um, features that allow to generate high quality signal. For example, um, production link which means CPINs can automatically link the found crashes to those already, already hitting users. So when CPINs can reproduce such crashes, uh, it can automatically attach a replay video and log cat logs and uh, um, photo localization info to help developers remove the crash from um, users. And second, set user prediction. So CPIN use machine learning to automatically um, predict whether it's found crashes will later hit users or not if, if, um, if not fixed. And if the prediction result is positive, CPINs can file tasks to developers to raise the awareness. And third, uh, CPIN boots the signal by considering inferred signal. So that means if both inferred static analysis and CPIN's dynamic analysis reveal the same issue, we um, consider high risk, risk issue. And for these cases, we file tasks immediately to our developers. And we found the fixed rate for such cases is very high, and currently is around 100%. So finally, let's revisit on why we see CPIN as a friction-free fault finding technique. Well, CPIN's search engine automatically designs system-level tests without manual assistance. And CPIN's evolution workflow automatically uh, localizes the fault and triage the crash to the right owner. And CPIN's bots automatically comment on diffs, file tasks, detect fixes, and close relevant tasks, just like humans do. So as you can see here, every step is, fu is fully automated. And these are all designed to free our developers from tedious manual testing effort and move faster on shipping impact. So in the future, we're working on smarter guided head design algorithm. And meanwhile, shipping will also be able to work on iOS as well. So we're also considering to make shipping av available outside Facebook. Um, if you have any feedback for us, please visit the survey link here and help us build a friction-free shipping for everyone. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. We hope to see you at the happy hour and after party across the street at the City National Civic Center starting at 6 p.m. Just like this morning, you will need to go through metal detectors, so we recommend you travel light. We do welcome you to check your bags at Coat Check.